I live on a massive, dirty ice cube that extends underground as deep as a 10-story underground parking garage. Much of this ground is actual ice, like frozen volumes of water the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. And this ice is suspended among mounds of dust from glacially pulverized mountains, peppered with grasses, mosses, bits of shrubs, ice-aged bison, horses, wolves, lions, mammoths, and bears, oh my, and camels. I'm talking about the top of the world that is dark all day in the winter and light out all summer. And while polar camels seem interesting enough to merit a discussion all their own, I'm going to speak of something even more pressing, permafrost. The term permafrost makes it sound like it's not going anywhere. I'm a permafrost scientist, and I can tell you, it is. Permafrost is any part of the Earth's subsurface that has been frozen for more than two consecutive years. This frozen ground, formed at the rate of an inch every few decades, now thaws out about an inch every few seasons. Seasonal thaw leaves behind pits in the ground where those Volkswagen-sized ice volumes existed near the surface. When such pits develop in the forest, trees lean or fall into them, leaving behind a bunch of tipsy trees that we call a drunken forest. <laughs> When these voids develop beneath roadways, they can swallow the front end of a truck. Buildings list like sinking ships on this thawing ground, and many, including those in my neighborhood around Fairbanks, Alaska, don't have indoor plumbing because of the shrinking and swelling of thawing and freezing ground. So, How can a dirty, thawing ice cube in Alaska affect the temperature in Spain or Myanmar? The answer is carbon. Carbon is to the atmosphere what goose down is to a winter jacket. It holds in warmth. We have known since the 1820s about the greenhouse effect, and we've hypothesized since the 1880s that human industry would contribute to it. So that is old news. What's newer and still evolving is our grasp of the speed scale, and variation of the impact. Arctic amplification refers to this effect where polar regions of the Earth warm faster than the rest of the globe. Like the greenhouse effect, this was hypothesized more than a century ago. Today, the Arctic is warming four times faster than the rest of the planet. Arctic amplification bodes poorly for permafrost carbon all of those buried plant and animal bits that I mentioned before. Permafrost is like the Earth's freezer, and it contains more than a quadrillion kilograms of carbon. I know, that is a large, meaningless number to many of us, so let me help a little bit. Think of the weight of nine and a half Mount Everests, give or take half an Everest. And that's a lot of give or take, so I'm going to come back to that in a minute. As permafrost thaws, Greenhouse gases from bacteria eating, breathing, and farting, and all of that new available organic matter can cause more warming. This leads to more thaw, which releases more greenhouse gases, which then leads to more warming and then more thaw. And this continues in a positive feedback cycle, or a self-reinforcing feedback cycle. Because atmospheric carbon is a global concern, we want to know how much carbon exactly is in permafrost, and how quickly is it being released? These questions are deceptively difficult to answer. Permafrost ecosystems involve hydrology, biology, geology, chemistry, and meteorology. So where do we go for answers? Because there's no simple equation, scientists turn to computer models to get an idea of possible planetary projections. These models improve with increases in computational power, better descriptions of initial conditions, and more detailed observations of thaw processes in the field. I'm what they call a ground truth field scientist, and I work on the latter two of these aspects. That is, describing the current state of permafrost and measuring actual thaw processes in the field. My primary field site is an Army Corps of Engineers permafrost research facility just down the road from my cabin. This site is one of the best in the world to study permafrost because above ground, 
we observed the effects of surface thaw within the boreal forest. And below ground, the Army Corps has dug nearly 500 meters of passageways through permafrost. The tunnel walls are a mural depicting the story of late Ice Age freeze and thaw seasons analogous to the way that banded cliffs of the desert southwest portray eons of changing ocean and climate patterns. Patterns in permafrost show the history of glaciers, streams, ice-aged animals, and even weather events. Buried ice lenses, about as thick as your finger, mark cold snaps that lasted a handful of days tens of thousands of years ago. What I've been calling massive, dirty ice cubes are more accurately termed ice wedges. These features grew incrementally during cold winters as the Earth's surface froze, contracted, and split in a pattern that looks like mud cracks the size of parking spots when viewed from above. Such polygonal ground still decorates the surface of the Arctic tundra. Once dormant polygonal ground unveils itself today in drunken forests as near-surface ice wedges thaw out. And these are just the effects we can see. As permafrost defrosts, buried organic material becomes a buffet for flatulent bacteria that turns solid carbon into carbon dioxide and methane. Over the course of 100 years, in our atmospheric down jacket, a single carbon dioxide molecule counts for one feather, and a single methane molecule counts for 25 feathers. Permafrost holds carbon dioxide and methane in place in multiple ways. It keeps organic material frozen, and it plugs cracks in the earth that cap untold multitudes of natural gas seeps. This second part is termed the cryosphere cap, and the rate and amount of emissions due to modern-day thaw are not fully understood. The highest flux fossil methane seep in the Arctic is about 400 miles west of Fairbanks, near Kotzebue, Alaska. And it was discovered because large portions of a lake surface remained unfrozen in the winter when all of the surrounding water bodies were frozen stiff. Jacuzzi-like bubbles emanate from 15 and 50-foot deep pockmarks on the lake bottom. These bubbles are microbially produced methane from some deep source of fossil carbon. Nearby drilling records and electromagnetic probings suggest that permafrost below the lake, which we call E.C. Lake, approaches 500 feet thick. And this brings up a couple of questions. How is the deeply sourced gas making its way up to the surface? And how many more seeps like this one exist? After several years of study, we still don't have answers to these questions. We do know that 10 tons of methane come out of E.C. Lake every day. That's the weight of a semi-truck without the trailer. And this is just one of the seeps that we know about. So, incomprehensible mountains of carbon mobilized by permafrost thaw, and daily semi-trucks of methane coming out of Arctic lakes. This sounds really bleak, but there is some good news. One company called Frost Methane built a contraption on E.C. Lake that funnels methane out of one of the seeps and burns it before it gets to the atmosphere. This turns that 25-feather methane into one-feather carbon dioxide. You have got to love it when the answer to one of life's major problems is lighted on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Frost methane continues to seek out and combust methane from sources all around the globe, including a pig waste lagoon that emits as much methane as E.C. Lake every day. Someday, the methane from that lagoon will be harnessed to generate usable energy. And this is a really interesting concept, because the methane that comes out of agricultural emissions dwarfs that from geologic emissions around the world. As individuals, we can stuff fewer feathers into our shared atmospheric jacket by adjusting our appetite for fossil fuels. I know, I know, you've heard this before, but maybe better understanding our own contribution could be motivating. Consider that a gallon of gas weighs six pounds, and five and a half of this is carbon. 
When you burn that gas, every carbon atom in it grabs onto two oxygen atoms from the air and it gets heavier. This means that burning a single gallon of fuel turns five and a half pounds of carbon into 20 pounds of carbon dioxide. Say your car gets 20 miles to the gallon. This would mean that every mile you drive puts one pound of carbon dioxide into the air. Maybe you change your oil every three to 4,000 miles. That's three to 4,000 pounds. That means between oil changes, you have emitted the weight of your car in carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And that's if you get 20 miles to the gallon. Can you imagine launching a Subaru into the atmosphere at every oil change and it stays there for a thousand years? <laughs> I can't. Airplanes, figure a gallon of jet fuel for every second of flight. That works out to be a car's weight in carbon dioxide about every three minutes. How long was your last flight? Mine was not short, and the irony is not lost on me. <laughs> I'm not here to tell you how to travel. Just be aware of the impact of your decisions. Let's talk shopping. An ocean freighter, like the kind that carries Amazon goods, holds about two million gallons of fuel. A ship can burn nearly a million gallons in transit from Asia to North America, delivering 20 million pounds of carbon dioxide along the way. By shopping local, you reduce your contribution to the emissions from ships, trains, airplanes, trucks, and vans that deliver your individually wrapped trinket that you might return anyway. More selective travel and fewer online orders really can have an impact. But our individual efforts, while they make literal tons of difference, are only part of a lasting solution. Voting with ballots as well as behavior matters. <laughs> Governments have the power to place our children's problems in the lap of the industries currently profiting at their expense. I'm not suggesting that I know how to solve the problems facing humanity or the atmosphere. I am suggesting that we tread more lightly on the Earth while we work together using the most up-to-date information to figure them out. If you are already doing your part, thank you. Please be nice to the people who aren't. <laughs> Everyone is doing the best they can with the information they have, and we are going to need a lot of friends to solve these issues. <laughs> Thanks. Given the political polarity about climate change, it's tempting to think that individuals with opposing viewpoints have nothing in common. But that's not true. We all breathe the same air and live on the same thawing ice cube. Permafrost, like so many precariously balanced systems, is giving us all the same warning. Thank you.